Hey everybody, welcome back to another one of our hashtag short track discussions videos. Today we're going to be talking about the two new short tracks that have come out recently for Star Trek, Q&A and The Trouble with Edward. Both of these episodes are pretty short. Obviously, they're short treks, so I figured it's okay to kind of put these conversations together. Let's jump right into it. So rather than going by scene by scene, kind of like what I did with the trailers and some of my episode reviews, I think it's important for us to just zero in on the topic of conversations for both of these episodes, because both of them have kind of drummed up kind of the negativity train again and have caused quite the stir within the Trek fandom and a lot of discussions out there. And I want to throw my kind of take on all this stuff like that, and maybe give you guys some ideas and some new perspectives on how to look at these two episodes. So let's first look at the episode Q&A. The whole episode, again, is well acted, well directed, well edited. The principal photography is great. The special effects are great. Both episodes really are just super well produced. And I don't think there's anything really too big of a deal inside of Q&A. The only real problem with Q&A is the smiling sequence with Spock. Now, the whole episode kind of, in my opinion, centers around this one particular conversation between number one and Spock inside of the turbo lift. The strength of a Starfleet crew is in its diversity and differences. I would never ask a crew member to suppress or conceal their nature. I do think one must be aware, however, of how one is perceived by one's comrades. Not because you're half Vulcan, but this is the advice I'd give to anyone whose ultimate goal is command. And if you want to command, you're going to have to learn to keep your freaky to yourself. Even if that's painful. I have been doing that all my life. And it is. So here we are seeing a very young Ensign Spock getting some mentorship from a much more experienced Starfleet officer, which is, hey, you need to make sure you're keeping your, your freaky in check. And he replies saying that he's been doing that all his life, but obviously he hasn't perfected that just yet. I think that this is causing a bit of a stir, obviously, because one, Spock smiles, which people don't really like, even though he has smiled before um, in, in Star Trek canon, but whatever. He smiled here, and they don't like that. And it also, on the surface, if you're just looking at this conversation from a surface level, it looks to be kind of undermining the relationship of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It seemed as though the overarching kind of connection between those three characters inside of Star Trek canon was that Spock eventually learns how to appreciate and really indulge in his human side without getting too overly emotional and losing some of his Vulcan side. And that was kind of his whole coming out of the shell thing was kind of the connection between the three of those characters over decades. You lied. I implied. Put aside logic. Do what feels right. On the surface, it seems as though it's kind of undermining that, where it's like uh, Spock was always totally fine with expressing his emotions, and then this character came in, you know, number one, and told him to just knock it off, and it seems to be almost being in reverse somehow of his character development. I took at it like this. I didn't look at it. Initially, I looked at it that way, where it's like, I feel like you guys are kind of reversing his character development, but when I really sat down and thought about it, I actually think that as a young Ensign Spock, he's going to be pulling in all different types of information, input, and advice, and wisdom from different people in his life. And I think that the advice that number one gave him is to continuously bury it as far down as possible, which is, of course, a huge overreaction and a massive pendulum pendulum swing all the way to one side of ideology of don't let people really see your kind of freaky side, as she put it. And that's one way to approach it, but she's obviously not perfect. She doesn't necessarily know all of the answers. And I think that the relationship, I think that's where Spock kind of starts. And that's the kind of Spock we get introduced to in TOS is someone who's actively trying to keep all of those things shoved down even harder. He's been doing it since he was a kid, and now he's getting the same advice being in Starfleet. And I think the Spock that we meet in TOS is that way. And then the next several decades is him working with Kirk and McCoy to perfect that balance between being in touch with his human side and being a little bit less of a tight butt, as they say, and also being able to remain logical and keep his wits about him and not getting too, you know, involved with his emotions. I feel like that's kind of the point of Spock's growth now. I think that they're adding a little depth to how he arrived at who he was, and then we saw him kind of change over time. Because if you think about us as 
people, and Spock is obviously a Vulcan, but he's still a person. People have all these kinds of relatable connections is that over time we kind of shift and we have different changing of opinions and different attitudes and how we react to certain things and how we approach different topics. And sometimes we're more, you know, kind of standoffish and want to be alone. And other times where people are more sociable and sometimes different years call for different activities or different events call for different, you know, uh, activities. And it kind of shapes our kind of personalities as time goes on. So, do I think that this ruined Spock's, you know, character growth from the original series? No, I actually think that it added a little extra of depth and layers to it. And I would be curious to see them kind of play that out a little bit more with his relationship to Pike and number one leading up to the kind of much more stoic Spock that we saw in the original series. Because at this point, you know, at the original series, he's been getting all this advice from number one to kind of keep it buried. He's been hanging out with Pike, who is, you know, the consummate professional, uh, badass captain. And then he's also lost his, you know, sister. She's gone to the future. And, you know, so he's kind of been faced with some serious things that he continues, has to continue to bottle up. And then we meet him, you know, with Kirk and company, uh, you know, in the original series. So I feel like there's a bit of character growth here and they're kind of layering in why it was he was super stoic then and then kind of perfected his personality as time went on and, and we got to meet a more, you know, I guess you could say more humanized Vulcanish Spock that we got, you know, towards the end of the TOS movie. So I'm cool with it. I thought it was great. Uh, I, I, you know, I had no expectations for Q&A. I just expected it to be kind of a funny little episode with all of our favorite characters coming back. And that's exactly what it was. So I enjoyed it. Okay, so now let's jump right into the trouble with Edward. This episode was well acted, well scripted. I thought the editing was great. I thought the effects were great. I loved all the different ships and stuff like that that we saw in this episode. I loved all the little characters. I thought the comedy did kind of land really well. Um, I think that they did really great job kind of, you know, with the casting of this particular episode. Obviously, Archer being in there. I can't not hear Archer talking about Tribbles. So that's just the way the cookie crumbles or Bob's Burgers in some sequences talking about food. It felt like I was watching an episode of Bob's Burgers. The problem with this episode is that people feel like they've rewritten the entire history of the Tribbles and what that really means. And I need everyone to just, who is saying that, to just hear me out here. I, I had this really long kind of explanation kind of put together and stuff like that, but I actually came across a tweet from Larry Nemechek. At Nemechek? Nemechek, I think is how you say it. And he basically just said, summed it up by saying they didn't erase anything. They just added a little extra texture into the history of the Tribbles, which I kind of agree with. We didn't really know much about Tribbles leading up into this episode, and they've done Tribble stuff forever. They had Tribbles on Enterprise with Flocks. They had Tribbles, obviously, in the Trouble with Tribbles in the TOS, you know, series. They had them in TNG. They had them in Deep Space Nine. They've been all over the place, and they've done different things in different episodes. But the main kind of connecting thing is they reproduce a lot, and if they're not you know, kept in check, then it could overwhelm a population and potentially even destroy an entire planet, or in this case of this episode, an entire spaceship. So how does this potentially rewrite the Tribbles? Well, I don't think it rewrites them at all. I think that the Tribbles were known for being a reproductive kind of race and that they were born, as soon as the first one is born, they're automatically born pregnant, and then they immediately try to reproduce and continue to feed. I think this episode, all it did was just electrified the Tribble capability of reproduction. Edward said very plainly that he put his own DNA in there just to see what would happen, and it just started to reproduce like crazy. They weren't really even going after the food processors. They were just constantly reproducing like nonstop. And so I don't think that these are just vanilla Tribbles. That's why I don't think it re, you know, erases anything that we know about other Tribbles. I think that this is a specific case of a specific strain of Tribbles that Edward jacked with in order to increase their reproductive rate even faster than it already was to try to, you know, I guess, get food onto this planet, which they eventually arrived on that planet, and then they had to evacuate the whole planet anyways because they continued to just reproduce like crazy. And then we also found out at the end of the episode that they these genetically modified Tribbles wound up in Klingon space, which would also explain why the Klingons really super hate the Tribbles, and, and they have, like, genetically engineered beasts that, that go after the Tribbles, and they have, like, a huge hump that goes after the Tribbles. So they were dealing with genetically modified ones. So I just think that all we got was... 
that there's different types of Tribbles out there now, that there's the regular ones from their original planet, uh, and then now there's these crazy genetically modified ones that have to be hunted down and destroyed because, uh, you know, Edward just screwed up with their genetics. I don't think it ruins anything. I think it's just an expansion, and it's just fun. Like, I, I just, I, I, gosh, I can't continue to wrap my head around why people get so upset about these things. It's not, They didn't really break anything. They just tried to slide something in kind of very subtly and play with a fun Star Trek character, char you know, creature that we know, which is the Tribbles. I call it a character because they kind of are just like characters themselves, but and they just slid this right in there. It doesn't break anything. It's just an interesting little take of somebody tried to go a little overboard with the Tribbles, and they went crazy, and I don't think it damages the Tribble kind of continuity at all. And ultimately, I don't really think it particularly cares. Tribbles are just kind of a, a fun little story device and it was just a fun story it was a fun short trek it was a fun thing about the characters it was a fun thing to see what you know edward was going to do with them and it was just fun to see them overwhelm the ship and it was just i don't know it was just fun i don't know everyone has to be so worked up about both of these short tricks they were just fun i i don't know if my standards are so low or that y'all's standards could potentially be too high but I just feel like, you know, I, I just enjoyed them. And I feel like some people are expecting a little bit too much from the short treks. I mean, we got Calypso last grouping, which was very, very important. We still don't even know the answers to that short trek. But the other ones were kind of simple one-off little stories that, you know, were just okay and they weren't that bad. But they tried to be too serious, where in this case, I feel like they're just trying to share, like, simple little fun little stories that aren't anything that's going to be super detrimental to the overall, you know, connections of Star Trek as far as we know, but that are just fun and that we're just supposed to enjoy them as kind of an intermediary a little web episodes before we get back into the more serious full seasons of Star Trek. And I'm okay with it, but hey, not a lot of people can agree with me and that's okay. You know, some people really want to fight these things and that's all right. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I just say that I have difficulty understanding it. Not to mention the fact that I do know what CBS is up to. This whole friggin' Tribble thing was all just a ploy to start pumping out their stupid breakfast cereal. When your tummy needs a nibble, or a bowl of Tribble. We're pregnant. With flavor. Nah, but seriously, I'm curious to hear what all of you guys and gals think about these two short treks. Like I said, I enjoyed them. Some people didn't. I don't really understand why people didn't. But if you didn't enjoy them, throw a wide down below. Let's get that conversation started. Let's be nice to each other. I'm curious to hear what your perspectives are on this situation and what you guys think about my interpretation of these short treks. And I guess we'll see you guys and gals next time. Live long and prosper, my trickies! <laughs> <laughs>